And now for something completely different. <laughs> it's a rich man's world. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money. Markets. Life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. Hey, good morning and welcome to the show. Of course, it is uh, Wednesday. It's Hump Day edition and it is the first day of June, which uh, kicks off the last month of the second quarter. So we're now wrapping up earnings season and we're going to get into portfolio rebalancing later this month. And, you know, it's going to be all kinds of goodness as we move into summers. And uh, of course, we're we're heading that direction, right? Summer's here. So now we've had a really tough slog to markets first part of this year. And of course, you know, that's been one of the big challenges so far for investors is, you know, where we are now, right? Markets have been bouncing here for the last couple of days. That's been nice. We kind of trimmed back after being right there on the brink for the S&P 500, right on the brink of a technical bear market being down 20%. Markets have recovered from that here a bit. Consumer sentiment, extremely bearish. Consumer sentiment index is out yesterday. Expectations are pretty much across the board. Nobody, you know, you ask somebody in a poll, it's like, you know, hey, uh, what do you think about the economy? It's like they don't even answer anymore. It's just they're they're so dismal. A new poll out uh, yesterday, 25% of Americans are now looking to postpone retirement because of inflation, right? So what are people doing about it? Well, they're trimming back on their, their traveling as an example, right? So not driving as much, cutting back on food purchases, not going out to eat as much. And, you know, and it's interesting when you think about this, yes, we have inflation. Yes, costs have gone up here a little bit. But if you're thinking about having to delay your retirement because prices are up here temporarily, you probably weren't ready for retirement to begin with, right? Um, you know, this is this is one of the things that we'll talk about more with Danny today um, when he joins us. Just you know, kind of looking at you know this idea of retirement. There was an interesting poll out just recently. Young millennials think that they can retire with three hundred. They just had three hundred thousand dollars. That's all they need to retire. They're good. Right. So, you know, the problem with that is, is that, you know, as you get older, you kind of realize that you need more money than that to retire on if you don't want to work. Now, if you're going to work in retirement and do other things, that that's a different story. Maybe you don't need as much saved up. Um, If you have a, a hobby that pays some additional income, okay, maybe you don't need as much saved up. But again, the reality is, is for most individuals to sustain a, a lifestyle in retirement without working is going to require more than 300000 But, you know, this is, this is a little bit of the disconnect that we get, you know, as, you know, when we're young, we don't need as much, right? And then you have kids and a family and a bunch of other stuff, and you realize you need a whole lot more. Um, but this is, but this is an, an interesting time here that we live in. Now, yesterday... Joe Biden had Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, at the White House to talk about combating inflation. Now, as we get ready to go in the midterm elections, inflation obviously is weighing on, well, again, if you're in the 25% looking to postpone retirement because of inflation, well, you're probably not too excited about the current administration. And that's really kind of showing up in a lot of the voting polls as well. You know, if you take a look at the reasoning why people are well, not happy with the current administration, it's primarily inflation. Gasoline, as an example, was about 269 a gallon when Joe Biden took office. It's now 467 national averages of yesterday. That was up five cents in a day. Um, that is certainly weighing on sentiment, right? Not, not just consumer sentiment, voting sentiment as well. And, you know, regardless of, of who you want to blame for it, now, Joe Biden yesterday kind of blaming the previous administration on tax cuts causing the inflation. That's not really the issue. You know, it's the fact that we sent, you know, $5 trillion worth of money. And look, both presidents were, were doing this, right? The, we started sending checks under the Trump administration. We continued more checks under the Biden administration. Both administrations directly responsible for the inflation that we currently have. And, and now, of course, you know, if you're in the office, you get the blame for it. That's just how that all works. But this is going to be one of the big items here over the next few months as we head into midterms. There's a lot of, and we talked some about this yesterday, a lot of really bad ideas being floated around about how to solve the inflation problem. 
right? And, you know, everything from price controls to, to uh, you know, charging companies for price gouging, et cetera, those don't create less inflation. Those actually wind up creating more inflation because you reduce production. So, uh, look, the, 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 the bottom line is simply this. If you want to get rid of inflation in gas prices, you need more oil production. And now OPEC talking about potentially ramping up their production. Oil prices as a function are trading at a huge premium relative to where they should be trading. So we're likely going to get some relief later on this summer, maybe as we head into the fall, get some relief in oil prices, particularly if production does come up from other countries or if we get a resolution of what's happening in Russia. So there's a lot of things that could change this dynamic very quickly before the midterms, but trying to force it to change is not going to happen. Now, the Federal Reserve of course, is their, their methodology here is to hike interest rates to slow the economy. And again, we've talked about this before. How does that work, right? If I charge higher interest rates, I'm going to impact consumers even more. So if I'm the president heading into an election, and he said this yesterday, Joe Biden's like, I'm not going to mess with the Fed. I'm going to let the Fed do what they want. They're going to focus on inflation fight. I'm going to do what I can over here. That's fine and dandy, but if you're the sitting president going into election and the Fed's hiking rates and tapering their balance sheet, that's not going to make the situation better because that's going to make things even more costly for consumers in terms of their debt charges, right? How much they're paying in credit card charges, how much they're paying for loans, auto loans, etc. That's all going to get more expensive. And where are consumers right now getting money to spend? They are diving into credit cards at a very rapid rate. We have had a massive increase in the amount of consumer credit increases over the course of just the last few months because they're trying to figure out a way to pay for all these higher costs. In fact, the, the consumer debt levels have now reached a peak uh, a higher than we saw back in 2019. So we've had this massive surge in credit because consumers are trying to make ends meet. Now you're going to make that credit even more expensive. And what will happen, of course, is now that 25% of Americans looking to, re, you know, having to postpone retirement because of inflation is now going to become 30, 40, 50% of Americans having to postpone retirement because not only are costs higher, the cost of borrowing, cost of debt, et cetera, has all gone up as well. And their cost of living is becoming insurmountable in terms of trying to maintain that. And, and that's going to weigh on that consumer confidence even more. But again, this is the whole purpose of the Fed hiking rates. Slow consumption through higher prices and higher costs. And if I can do that, then I get deflationary pressures, right? If I can make prices high enough, I'm going to have less consumption. Less consumption leads to lower demand, lower demand leads to lower prices and right now we have a big inventory supply glut you know a lot of that supply chain disruption that we had in 2020 2021 has now been worked through if you've been paying attention to a lot of the federal reserve kind of regional manufacturing indexes supply delivery times are coming down very sharply those supply chains are starting to ease up this is leading to inventory builds for companies. We just saw this recently with both Amazon, Walmart, Target talking about too much inventory. If there's too much inventory, eventually these companies go, I gotta get this off my shelves, right? I don't need this anymore. This is costing me money. You gotta get this stuff moved through. That means discounts. So <laughs> good for consumers, you're gonna be able to buy stuff cheaper, but this is all part of that process of trying to bring inflation back in control, and none of that is really great for economic outcomes. We'll talk more about this with Danny Ratliff right after the break. Don't go away, right here on The Real Investment Show. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Some people don't know about bonds. I am told this is a bond. I've never seen a bond before. I never owned a bond in my portfolio. It is terrifying. Get to know bonds in our next free Lunch and Learn. Thursday, June 2nd with Richard Rosso, Danny Ratliff, and special guest Lance Roberts. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. The thing about bonds with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts. Real Investment Advice. 
Do you know what you don't know when hiring and retaining quality employees? Compensation is more than just wages. It's personal time off. The vacation days, healthcare benefits, a 401k. Do you know what's important to them? Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable, effective package that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm North Van Troberts. I've got bad news for Danny Ratliff this morning. Danny's always telling me I can't retire, but I've got, I've got bad news. I'm heading out to L.A. to be a lifeguard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been working on my bikini body. I'm gonna mm -hmm. look good in my speedo. Oh yeah, yep, five hundred thousand dollars a year, be a lifeguard out in the sweet. LA. You, you know, I hate to break this gig. to you, but you know how pilots have age restrictions. Yeah, pretty sure lifeguards do as well. I think you're just over it. I don't know yeah. if you can do the job. You can do the job. I think I think that's the case, right? Yeah. I think I think if I can out swim and outrun the thirty year old, I'm good. <laughs> Oh man, it's worth I'm a gonna, shot. I'm gonna be like, uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm just thinking like, you know, a lot of like, you know, hey, Maverick's still flying airplanes. Sure. And he's fifty. He's two years older than I am. Why right? not? Exactly. He's not near as tall as you are. Exactly. And he's fifty. He's two years older. He's mm -hmm. fifty nine. Yeah. So, and he's out flying jets. Flying jets. Yeah. Not really. He's not really. Doing but he it. looks good. But he looks good doing <laughs> it. So if he, if he can fly jets at 59, I can be a lifeguard at you could 57. Be a, you could be a CG lifeguard. It, exactly. So anyway, That's next so kid's birthday party, you're more than welcome to come over, sit by the pool, make sure nobody drowns. It'll, be great. <laughs> It'll cost you. Hey, if you're going to pay me 500 grand, I'm all there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. About that. Checks in the mail. <laughs> morning, Danny. How are you? Doing well. You? Uh, well, I'm trying to figure out how to be a lifeguard. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm like working way too hard if I can sit on a beach. I mean, come on. Man, isn't that right? Uh, anyway, a couple of things going on this morning. Uh, I was talking just for the break. Interesting survey out. This, uh, it came out yesterday. 25% of Americans now looking to postpone retirement because of higher inflation. And I think that's interesting because if, you know, look, yes, we have some higher prices. But if your whole inflation is hinging, I mean, if your whole retirement is hinging on lower prices, then there's probably, you've probably got more work to do on your retirement plan, right? Yeah, I, I would think a lot of people already have a lot more work to do on their retirement plan. I mean, like you mentioned, you know, you talk about millennials think they need 300,000 to retire. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are 65 right now and that's all they have. Mm -hmm. And you have to try to make this, these funds work. And I think what happened here is there's a lot of people who are they had to reinvent themselves. Number one, some people were forced into retirement a little bit earlier than they anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, and so they weren't necessarily ready for it in that aspect. And, you know, maybe they could make it work from a, a monetary standpoint. But at the end of the day, once you start seeing these higher prices, it does begin to start to weigh on people. I mean, look, I'm visiting with lots of people who they don't have this issue mm -hmm. where they, they have to postpone retirement, but they are. Or they're going back. They, you know, maybe they got the pink slip during the pandemic. And now they're going back and doing contract work. Well, I know a lot of people who are doing that. In fact, had two calls just yesterday. People who were retired could, I mean, the financial plan, everything suggests they could stay and remain retired. But they're like, you know what? 
I've got an opportunity to make some money, go back to work. Inflation sucks. We're not traveling like we yeah. typically would. Why not? Well, you know, it's interesting you said that because, you know, we had this, you know, everybody was talking about the great resignation during the yeah. pandemic, right? It's like, oh, look at all these people. They're all retiring from work. No, they weren't retiring voluntarily. See, that's a big, you know, they were resigning, yes, they because they were given this nice option, which says, you know, Danny, if you would choose to resign, we would appreciate it and we'll pay you very happily for that. Um, if you choose not to resign, we're probably going to fire you. <laughs> And so there was this great net resignation. Now, all of a sudden, there's this great reemployment thing going on because a lot of these guys that resigned are now, as Danny said, some by choice, some by force, um, are going back to work. And, and again, there's a lot of opportunity out there. The, the, you know, one of the big problems, especially here in Houston, where you have a, the oil and gas industry, is, is lack of experience. And a, a lot of these guys that resigned, um, during the pandemic, they have all the experience, and, mm -hmm. and now with oil prices up and, and companies needing to do more work, they're, you know the the lack of experience in the younger ranks is becoming problematic. So they're having to go out and hire these people to come back and say, "Hey, we'll pay you well to come back and go to work." I've I've talked to quite a few guys like you that have gone back to work as contractors and consultants, etc., paid very well. To go well, back to that's work. That's right. And so I think another thing that we're seeing as well is with interest rates rising, we've seen people go ahead and take the pension payouts, the lump sums. And with the ability of knowing that, hey, I'm going to go ahead and, and reap the benefits of this at the moment, because look, some people, it, it, you do the math and they're actually, they're losing money to continue to work. And these are guys that weren't ready to quite retire, but they're finding that a lot of times they're able to go back and do 1099 work, contract work. Um, you know, either for their company or maybe a, a contractor they worked with. Um, it, there's so many moving parts right now, and there's so much of a need mm -hmm. that people are finding it easier and easier to do so. But, you know, like this survey says, people are having to change their habits. So, you know, it mentions 46% of the people are dining out less. 42% are cutting back on grocery shopping. 31% driving less. I mean, we've talked about yeah. this, how people are, um, you know, they're really starting to, to figure out, calculate, okay, I'm going to go here, wait, maybe I go tomorrow and do all these things at once while I'm already out. I mean, I've done that. Uh, cutting subscriptions, spending less or canceling vacations. 23% uh, canceled vacations are spent less. And I can tell you, I'm visiting with a lot of people as well who they don't have to do it, but they're doing it automatically because it doesn't feel good. Markets are down. Um, nobody, like you said, sometimes it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And by doing all these things, yep. this is not, this doesn't bode well for you know, great growth. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you know, it, it's always a function that, you know, we talk about, you know, people wanting people to save more, but that's actually an anathema to the economy. What we need is everybody to spend more if you want a strong economy. But that's the paradox of savings. You know, the more people save, the weaker the economy gets. And, and, and it is it is kind of funny because, you know, naturally that's how we work. But, you know, in reality, we really don't want that. We really want people to go out and spend more and, and, and do more in the economy because that's what makes the economy stronger, makes stock markets go up, you know, all those type of things. So, you know, it is interesting. Well, and usually those are those are all things that you want to happen. You want people to save. Mm -hmm. You want people to also spend at the same time. But, you know, this survey also suggests it says 36 percent of respondents have reduced their savings. Twenty one percent are putting away less for retirement. Like you mentioned, yeah. credit card balances are going up. These are all things that when you typically put them all together, that doesn't point to this this robust growth because we're fighting inflation. But the other aspect is I would encourage anybody out there who if you're starting to say, you know what, I'm not going to save because I want to do X, Y, Z, I'd continue to save. I'd continue to invest. These are great opportunities that I think we're going to see in front of us. And so, you know, generally, I know everybody doesn't feel really good, but these are times I think when we can be pretty optimistic in some ways because maybe we're finally going to get that opportunity to buy things at better prices. Well, and, and again, you know, it's interesting. It's That's also one of those paradoxes, right? Mm -hmm. When you get everybody, and, and this is the problem we have right now, is that we have all these people, and I'm getting a lot of phone calls lately. It's like, hey, I've been sitting on a bunch of cash, and I'm just, you just tell me when the right time to go in the market is, and I'm going to buy everything, right? The problem is, is that when we get to the bottom of the bear market, wherever it is, you're not going to want to buy anything because you're going to be convinced everything's going lower. And I'm not, I'm seeing way too many people being too optimistic. They're all looking back to March 2020 going, I don't want to miss that one again. And you got to remember the difference is is that the Fed is just now starting to to hike rates, right? We're only at 75 basis points on on rate hikes. They're going to be hiking rates at least two more times of 50 basis points, if not three more times of 50 basis points, getting closer to 2% on the Fed funds rate. And they're just starting their quantitative tightening program 
this month. They're going to be reducing bond purchases by $60 billion this month. That's taking liquidity out of markets, not putting into markets. Now, that doesn't mean that markets are, are you know, are, are going to go straight down from here. In fact, you know, I think there's a reasonable expectation that we could have a decent summer for stocks. And that really kind of fly in the face of everybody because of just kind of where we are right now and what people think. But in a way, that's exactly what we need to have happen in order to have the rest of the bear market, right? And this is going to be the, the interesting thing is that, you know, Jim Cramer out um, just yesterday talking about the fact that, you know, we could have a very good summer for stocks. And that's exactly what we need to have is a really good summer for stocks. Because again, as I was saying, there's so many people that are, I, I got emails yesterday from people like, this market is going to be down for the, you know, is going down from here and it's just going to stay down for the next 10 years. Okay, A, that's not the way the market works, but, <laughs> you know, that's that type of sentiment. We have, and there's 8,200 articles that were written on recession in the last couple of months. It's just been, you know, just a flood of bearishness all across the board. And markets always work contra on a contrarian basis. When everybody thinks one thing's going to happen, something else tends to happen. So what we need to have here is a fairly strong summer for stocks. I agree with Jim Cramer. We've got such negative sentiment, such bearishness in the overall market. That sets up this, this, this ability for stocks to do better in the summer this year. And then once we get everybody back onto the bullish bandwagon, right? Jim Cramer will be on the air. It's like the, the bear market's over. It's time to buy stocks. You need to be long everything. And once we start to see that, that bearishness evaporate, that's when you're going to have the right setup for the rest of the bear market. Because it's all about markets work on psychology. And when you have everybody on kind of one side of the boat, you're going to have another kind of a equal and opposite reaction the other direction. That doesn't mean markets are going to go to all-time highs. But, you know, we could have a fairly decent summer of, of stock performance. There's a lot of stocks that are really beaten up. They could perform very well this summer. Um, Amazon had a great day yesterday on news that the, the board of directors approved their stock split. So Amazon will split, I think, in June or July. Google's set to split in June. Uh, this month. So, you know, we're, we're going to see some more of that action going on. That's going to, you know, provide some buying opportunities here as well. But again, we still have the other shoe to fall so far, right? We've had one shoe fall up to this point in terms of the initial part of this decline, but we've still got to deal with the Fed tightening, the Fed reducing their balance sheet, um, everything Danny's talking about here, inflation, consumption, all that, that's all recessionary in nature. And if we have a recession in the next six, eight months, nine months, 10 months, as we start to wind up this year, maybe get to early next year, that's going to put more downward pressure on stocks. But, you know, again, just something to think about. We'll come back. We'll talk some more about this. Um, also, why you need to be eating, eating seaweed and crickets. Don't go away. investment advice blog it's required reading for the informed investor catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com some people don't know about bonds i am told this is a bond i've never seen a bond before i never owned a bond in my portfolio it is terrifying get to know bonds in our next free lunch and learn thursday june 2nd with richard rosso danny ratliff and special guest lance roberts register now at realinvestmentadvice.com the thing about bonds with ratliff rosso and roberts realinvestmentadvice.com Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. 
we can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. Here's the funny thing about taxes. You don't have to have a higher tax rate to pay more taxes. If you feel it's your patriotic duty to pay taxes, ain't nothing stopping you. So quit bitching about it and start paying more taxes. Warren Buffett pays less taxes than a secretary. Great. Pay more taxes. All talk, no action. The Real Investment Show podcast. Lead by example. Jamie Dimon, write a check to the government for a billion dollars. You can afford it. At realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at Stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA plan. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. Some people don't know about bonds. Get to know bonds in our next free lunch and learn. Thursday, June 2nd with Richard Rosso, Danny Ratliff, and special guest Lance Roberts. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. The thing about bonds with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts. Realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. The last time that markets lost money in the month of June was in 2015. So just a little statistic for you that uh, June tends to be a fairly decent month for stocks. And again, this has a lot to do with portfolio rebalancing as we get into the end of the month, um, and particularly this year, because the first five months of the year have been so hard for stocks. And, and again, while May was re really challenging, that uh, little bit of rally in the last couple of days in May actually reversed almost all the losses for May. So it, it really wasn't that bad of a month after all. <laughs> if you want to look at it, it felt terrible. Turned out not to be that bad. Um, but uh, the month of June, um, particularly when the first part of the year has been so challenging, a lot of portfolio managers are off sides. They have too little equity exposure. They have too much cash. They have too little fixed income. And so you're probably going to see a bit of rebalancing this month and stocks being bought to put back onto balance sheets for the end of the quarter reporting. Uh, that'll really pick up pace as we get into the end of the month, um, just before reporting is required. So um, that's another reason why this market may actually perform a, a bit better here over the course of the next you know few weeks or so. Doesn't mean to take your eye off the ball, though, as we've been talking about this rally is potentially got some legs here, which is great. Um, but it's also one that will eventually most likely fail. And you're going to test back to lower levels, at least if not set new lows before this whole process is over, because you've got the Fed tightening their balance sheet, because you've got the Fed hiking rates, that is going to impact the economy and the markets as we go forward this year. So again, you want to use these rallies opportunistically to reduce risk rebalance your portfolio, you know, things that have, you know, if you took a whole bunch of risk in your portfolio over the last couple of years and that's not been working well for you, time to move some of that stuff off. Um, probably don't want to be short right now, the markets, 
because again, where the markets are set up, if you're heavily short the markets, you may want to cover those short positions and, and start to look to be a little bit more neutral, at least. And there's an old saying about markets, um, you know, depending on what you think about the market, if you believe we're in a bear market or in a bull market, it's, it's up to you. But there's an old saying that says in a bear market, you can only be neutral or short in a bull market, you can only be neutral or long. So there are points in a bear market, you know, if you're short the market, that's great. You've made some good money this year, but we're probably to that point that you want to move to more neutral bias, at least for the time being, and wait for your next good opportunity to short the markets, right? And that's if you, if you think the markets are going to go lower. If you're more of a bullish camp that thinks that we've already kind of worked through a big bulk of the decline, which would be the case if we're not going into recession. So if we're not going to be in a recession in the next 12 to 18 to 24 months, if you believe that, then we've probably completed the, the bulk of whatever correction we're going to have. If you think we're going to be in a recession in the next 12 to 18 months, then we have not finished that correction yet. This is only one part of that correction, and we've got more work to do. So again, just depends on your personal view of the markets and kind of the economy and what you think. But there's a lot of indicators right now that suggest at least for the month of June and July, um, we could probably see some stronger performance out of the markets, an opportunity to trade here a little bit um, and take advantage of that, and then get a little bit more defensive as we get later into the month of August and heading back into the end of the year. But you go go describe a little bit in, in more detail, because I'm thinking the average 401k investor or somebody who maybe not as uh, sophisticated, when you're talking about being, going short to neutral, what does that mean? Well, I mean, if you so if you've got a lot of positions, I, I had an email from a guy yesterday. He's like, I've been super short the market ever since April or ever since February. Okay, great. No problem. But you're going to give up a lot of those gains, mm -hmm. you know, um, by remaining short. And particularly if, if you know, we do have a reflexive rally in the markets, which seems to be, you know, odds are becoming increasingly likely of that. You're going to give up a lot of those profits. So, you know, so, you know, reduce your short positions, raise some more cash, reduce that exposure to the downside. If you think we're going to, you know, if you've, you know, if you've been just all in cash, you know, as an opportunity, there's a tradable rally here that we're starting to, to potentially put into place. Now, again, we've got some work to do to see if it's going to be sustainable, and we're not there just yet, but there's going to be some tradable opportunities here to put some cash to work on a short-term basis. So, again, depends on your view, but you know, cash is a great place to be when you need to be neutral just being cash. That way you don't have any risk. You don't have any risk. You reduce the risk in your portfolio by being in cash. Because cash doesn't go up or down, right? I can't lose money with cash. I may not make money, but I can't lose money. And sometimes that's a better opportunity in and of itself is just to maintain the value that I've achieved so far to date, right? Yep. Nope. That makes sense. Just wanted to clarify that. I know there's probably a lot of questions people thinking out there. What exactly that, does that mean? So right now we've got quantitative tightening about to happen. Mm -hmm. all, you know, all the word on the street is you know interest rates are going to go way up. And, you know, tomorrow, we're actually going to be talking about this. So tomorrow, June 2nd, uh, go to realinvestmentadvice.com. Lance, Richard, and myself will be talking about bonds, fixed income, um, interest rates, what is happening and how to invest in those areas right now. But quantitative tightening, that seems to be all everybody's talking about. Yeah. Major headline, you know, here we are. We're in June, finally. We're going to start QT. So what does this do to interest rates? And really, what does it do to the overall economy? And, and how quick can it occur? Well, you know, you know rates have already been up. Right. And so now we're talking about the Fed hiking rates, which is going to increase the cost of borrowing. So your credit card rates, those type of things, those are going to go up. There's a lot of there's a lot of interest rates, uh, margin rates, as an example. If you're going to borrow money on margin against your your investment account, that's generally linked to it's some points over the Fed funds rate. So they charge you, you know, we're going to charge you one point or two points, whatever it is, over the Fed funds rate. So as that Fed funds rate goes up, so does the cost of borrowing. Right. And there's a lot of there's a lot of debt out there that's linked to either what we used to call LIBOR. Uh, LIBOR is no, no longer used anymore, but the Fed funds rate or other sh very short term rates. And those are all affected by what the Fed funds does. Uh, so if the Fed raises those Fed funds rates, the cost of borrowing goes up. Now, all of a sudden, that that cost of whatever you were going to buy, as an example, has now got more uh, more expensive. And look, this is what's going on with the housing market right now. You know, we're watching housing prices come down, new home sales come down, 
you know, all that's occurring right now, particularly on, on the coastlines where you really had a lot of price appreciation, all of a sudden that activity has pretty much come to a standstill as people are going, well, I wanted to buy that house and I could have bought that house for, you know, $2,000 a month and now it's $3,000 a month and I can't afford that. You know, and, and this is one of the things that we go back to talking about financial solvability, you know, uh, or, you know in, or solvency rather, in households. You know, so many people are just basically living paycheck to paycheck that even small changes to their interest rates or their small changes to payments can make a big difference on whether or not they can make ends meet from one month to the next. And, and it shouldn't be that way. But this has just been a function of, you know, this kind of debt consumer driven society that we started building in 1980 as we deregulated the financial system under the uh, Reagan administration. And we just drove everybody into massive levels of debt that, you know, nobody ever even dreamed of back then. <laughs> it's like, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, nobody had credit card debt to speak of. And now you don't know anybody that's not up to their eyeballs in it hardly. So, you know, that's so when you have that kind of debt driven society, small changes to payments make a huge impact ultimately to economic activity. And, and ultimately, that's what we're going to see here over the next, you know, six, eight, 12 months as that occurs. Well, and it's interesting to, to think about if you're seeing people's credit card balances go up, more and more people are, are going out and applying for new ones. And yet, you know, on the other other side of the coin, people are saying they're cutting back spending. So that would suggest that people are spending this on just paying bills. Right. Well, uh, you know, I went to the grocery store um, over the weekend, mm -hmm. and it's interesting to see people paying for groceries with a credit card, not a debit card, with actual credit cards. And because again, you're you're paying for money, you're paying for groceries on on a credit card that you're going to charge interest rates on, and payments, etc. You know, for things you're going to consume in the short term. So it's it's interesting to see, you know, how people are shifting again to just make ends meet. Yeah, but I mean, I think a lot of people use credit cards in general and, and typically pay them off, or at least they historically have. But now that's, we're seeing those balances increase. Yeah, I was just saying that's very few people. There's 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 there there are a few people that are very conscientious about paying off their credit card every month, but the majority, well, the, the big majority of people aren't. But when you can, I think it makes sense. And, yeah. and first of all, if you do get hacked, and you know, we always talk about what happens if you know you have fraud on your account. Well, if you're using your debit card, you're giving access, you know, to your money. Whereas if you're on a credit card, it's the bank's money. Plus, you get rewards. I mean, look, I, I, you know what? I should be a spokesman, Lance. Uh, but but there are some there's there's some advantages to using a credit card in yeah, that no, aspect. There are, but you do need to pay it off, and I think that's the that's the kicker. We are seeing more and more people use them. We're seeing those balances increase, which all become problematic over time, especially if interest rates continue to increase, and then those payments increase as well. Yeah. No, I mean, look, we have one credit card we use in our house, yep. and we use it for major purchases, and we pay them off at the end of the month. And, but yeah, I mean, you know, we get points and all the other stuff and travel rewards and all that. It's all fine and dandy. But again, you let that slip for a month or two, and then all of a sudden you get that in extra interest payment. Like you're like, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it adds that, up quick. That uh, yeah, you you can't you can't let that get by. And that's the problem with most people is that they have the best of intentions on doing this. Like oh yeah, and I read a lot of articles like on CNBC and stuff about you know get this credit card. It pays the best rewards. And it's true. The problem is, as soon as you miss a couple of months worth of payments, you're in the trap. And if something happens to you financially, you're really in the trap at that point. And that debt just continues to accumulate. And, and you're not getting out of it paying the minimum payment. Well, that's so. the problem. People think, well, you know what? It's okay. I'll pay the minimum payment this month. I want to go do this, take yep. that trip, buy this thing. And that's where they get in trouble. All right. When we come back, Davos has a solution to your food problem anyway. We'll talk about that. Don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Some people don't know about bonds. I am told this is a bond. I've never seen a bond before. I never 
owned a bond in my portfolio. It is terrifying. Get to know bonds in our next free Lunch and Learn, Thursday, June 2nd with Richard Rosso, Danny Ratliff, and special guest Lance Roberts. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. The thing about bonds with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts. realinvestmentadvice.com. What worries you about your money? Enhance your financial success with RIA Advisors' free financial planning tool, MyBlocks. It's our online modular manager for your money and your life. Does your vision of retirement match up to reality? MyBlocks can help to determine how much you'll need and how you can achieve. Create your own personal financial vision for the next decade with MyBlocks, our free tool at RIAadvisors.com. Click on the Client Portal tab, RIAadvisors.com. Anyone can sell you insurance, and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Well, you know, talk a little bit about inflation this morning and, you know, all the things that go along with that. And I just thought it was interesting that, you know, the rich and the elite are in Davos currently, Davos, Switzerland, and solving the world's economic problems. And of course, you're the problem because, you know, you just kind of clog up the place for them. <laughs> How and, dare you? And they really don't like that that much. But they have a they have a solution here. They said the World Economic Forum is urging people to eat seaweed, algae, and cacti in order to save the planet. Now, here's my only question: What were you eating at Davos? Right? I hope they had a buffet of this. No, they didn't. Uh, their buffet was prime rib and steak and fish and you know all you know all the delicacies of the world were there. They're not eating. The, they're just. This is like Soylent Green, by the way. You know, <laughs> because you know they want you to do this. It's you know what's good for you is good for you, but that's not good for us. We're going to do this other thing. And uh, there's a there's a sh uh, show on. Uh, is it TNT? I think it's on TNT called Snowpiercer. And there was a movie. Okay, so there was a movie called Snowpiercer, and then they made a series out of it. Hmm. So if you don't know the movie Snowpiercer, what it is, it's a the world is now climate change has now impacted the entire world, and a, a guy builds a train, and this train just circumvents the globe constantly. It never stops because they tried to solve climate change by shooting things up into the atmosphere to control the climate, and it wound up creating an ice age on the planet. So this train just runs around this track around the world. Well, at the front of the train, all the rich people are in the front of the train. And they're eating everything, right? They have they have cat they have a cattle car where they raise cattle and all the fruits and vegetables and everything else, and, and they have a, a, an aquarium train that a, you know section that raises all the fish that they eat. So all the rich and and all the rich on the train are eating well. Those in the very back of the train that they call tailies are eating these protein bars made out of roaches that are ground up, and that's what they eat. And so, again, there's a mutiny, and they wind up taking over the train, et cetera. And because eventually this always happens, right? The, the rich do this, and they wind up all getting killed by the population when pitchforks and torches come out. But it's kind of a good, you know, the, the movie's kind of a good example of, you know, this idea of how society works and the rich and the poor and, and all this. But it's interesting because this is exactly kind of what you see happening in Davos. You have these rich people going, yeah. 
this is what we're doing for us. We, you know, we think everybody should be working on climate change, but we're going to fly here in private jets, take limos to everywhere we go, you know, all these type of things. They have a huge carbon footprint. And even though they should be doing the climate change work because they have the money and ability to do it, they want to put that task on you, which means you live a lower quality life standard while they live a higher one. Well, right. why, why should they do that? So they're going to events called Safeguarding Our Planet and People, mm-hmm. Staying on Course for Nature Action, and Limiting Global Temperature Rise to Stave Off Disaster. S, they took 1,500 private jets <laughs> to Davos. <laughs> Exactly. The irony or hypocrisy here it just it just drips yeah. with it. And so, so if you haven't if you haven't seen the movie Snowpiercer, it's actually not a it's not a great movie, but it's not a terrible movie. But it's a good movie on on economic strata in society. So if, if you want something to watch because you're out of everything else to watch, there you go. But yeah, I thought it was interesting. You should eat seaweed. And of course, you know, we've also heard you know crickets, roaches, you know all kinds of other and you know digestible insects. Who comes up with this stuff though? Because you know what they're really doing. They're trying to figure out how they can profit off of all of us. Is what's really happening. Well, they're trying to figure out. <laughs> they're they're not fighting anything there. No, no. <laughs> It's a, it's a fancy party, okay? And they're trying to figure out how can they make money off the rest of us. They're they're no, they're trying to figure out they're trying to figure out two things: a, how do they stay in power and stay rich, correct? Right, and then b, how do they profit off the masses, correct? Exactly. Now, if you think there's anything else going on there, you're highly delusional, highly delusional. Anyway, all right, um, get ready to wrap up the show here. A couple other things, um, you know. There's going to be, you know, it's kind of interesting. We we're talking, we started talking about the shows that Joe Biden met with, and we're going to talk some more about this tomorrow with Michael Leibowitz as well here on the show. But Joe Biden met with Jerome Powell yesterday uh, to talk about fighting inflation. And it was interesting because there was, you know, some comments coming out of this that, well, I'm not going to interfere. Like my predecessors, and he's speaking specifically about Trump, he's not going to interfere with the Fed. Remember, when the Fed was last trying to hike rates and reduce their balance sheet was 2018, markets declined by 20 percent. And uh, President Trump at that time was all over Jerome Powell saying, you know, maybe I need to fire you and hire somebody else because, you know, we can't have the market crashing. And it was interesting. So, so Joe Biden yesterday kind of made this kind of this kind of, you know, left handed shot over here against Trump over. He won't interfere with Jerome Powell, but maybe you should. Because you're heading in for an election, and already people are upset about inflation. And, you know, the problem with, the, like I said earlier, with the Fed hiking rates and, and tightening their balance sheet, that does set the markets up at risk, you know, for something to happen. So if they go too fast, if they go too far, they run the risk of causing something to break in the in the markets or in the economy. So, you know, this isn't, you know, as we were talking about earlier on the show, you know, I think there's a reasonable possibility here that we could get a rally here over the next month or so. Um, because we, we have so much negative bearish sentiment, we need that to reverse a bit. We need to get people to get bullish so that, you know, the market can actually have a bear market. But you've got, a, you've got too many people on the wrong side of the boat right now you got too many people that are bearish, which, you know, historically kind of suggests you're not quite ready to be there yet. So you kind of kind of have this ebb and flow in the markets. But a lot of this stuff that's going to go on with the Fed is going to negatively impact markets. I don't think that's something that Joe Biden really understands, particularly heading into an election, is that using the Fed to combat inflation doesn't have really great economic outcomes. And if people are upset already with you because of inflation, they're going to be really upset with you when they lose their job. <laughs> That's going to be, you know, kind of a whole nother consequence of, of, you know, kind of the upcoming midterms. And I think it's going to be interesting to watch what happens um, here over the next couple of months. And again, as I said, you know, there's, there's a real possibility that we could see stocks rally here a bit only because everything was so bearish but I think the thing to really watch here is interest rates, because even though the Fed's hiking rates, historically, when the Fed starts doing what they call quantitative tightening and reducing their balance sheet, that actually causes the longer end of the curve to decline. So short ends going up, longer end of the curve's declining, and that's what creates that inverted yield curve that typically sets you up for the recession. And that's the, so this is kind of the, the sequence of events that may be playing out here over the next couple of months is watching that yield curve because that's going to tell you a lot between what the Fed's doing and what the economy's actually doing 
we're going to start to see that kind of that inversion of the yield curve start to happen. So again, this is something we'll talk a little bit more about tomorrow on our Lunch and Learn as well at, at uh, noon. So if you go by the website, we're going to be talking about bonds, what are they, how they work, you know, um, and, and again, some of this impact on the economy and what that means for rates over the course of the next, you know, 10, 12 months as we potentially do set up potentially for a recession uh, down the road. But we'll see. And we've already seen the yield curve invert once earlier this year yep. and then uninvert. Now, historically, that does signal recession. What, what does it do when it goes back and forth? Well, no, it, it always does that. Um, you know, the, if you go back in history, it, it, yield curves don't normally just invert and, and then you have a recession, right? Uh, they typically tend to kind of waffle back and forth first. And again, this is why we talk about a lot is that you can't just pay attention to one yield curve. You have to pay attention to m multiple yield curves. And what you need is... We wrote an article that said, you know, what yield curve matters, and it's not one, it's all of them. <laughs> and so we track 10 different yield curves, and you need more than 50% of them to become inverted before you really have a good recession signal. And we had we had the 10 and the 2 and the 5 and the 10 inverted, but again, there was only 20% of the yield curves that we track. So we weren't really at risk here. So not surprisingly, they uninverted fairly quickly. And it was also had, had had impact to do with what was going on within the bond market at that particular mo moment in time and what was going on with the Fed. So, But as the Fed, again, hikes rates more, they're going to be lifting rates on the short end of the curve. That's going to slow the economy, which will drop rates on the long end of the curve. That's where you get that recession. Again, so we'll see probably sometime later this year, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, six of these yield curves starting to invert. And then that's where you're getting a much better signal about a recession. So interesting. Yeah. So we've been talking about this work from home yep. deal and how that's coming to an end. Yep. Elon Musk reportedly tells Tesla staff work remotely is no longer an option. They can pretend to work somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. in other words, you say you have been working at home. So if you've been pretending to work at home, you can now pretend to work somewhere else. Exactly. Or come back to work. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of companies are figuring that out is that, you know, the work from home thing is not really as productive. You know, you know, the people like it, right? Workers like it because they don't have to drive to work and they have a lot more freedom and flexibility to work around, you know, not work around the house, just show up for a Zoom meeting every now and then. Great dress code. Yeah, great dress code. But I think a lot of companies are starting to catch on to the fact that that really is not as productive yeah. Yeah, as, as it is. I find that I work, I mean, I think we always, we, we work quite a bit anyways, but I think I work more because now I'm not having that drive. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're just like, okay, well, if you take a break, you go do this and okay, well, you get back. Next thing you know, you're working until 10 o'clock. Right. Well, I know, but, but, you know, I don't know about you, but when, you know, I was driving in traffic, I spent the whole time talking to clients and other yeah, stuff. No, I was, I was always working. You know, yeah. I may have been driving, but I was still working. Correct. That's so right. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that, you know, for some people, I don't think it changes much. No. I but agree. there's a lot of people I think it changes a lot. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> there are some people that maybe don't need that flexibility. Exactly. All right. Wraps up the show for the day. Of course, uh, Danny Ratliff joining me. And uh, tomorrow noon at uh, on our website, it is a online event. By So simply go online today at realinvestmentadvice.com. Get registered for our All About Bonds kind of webinar we'll do that tomorrow at noon talk about what a bond is how it works how to use it what it means we'll talk about rates inverted yield curves talk about all that stuff so it'll all be tomorrow at noon on the website realinvestmentadvice.com to get registered do that today um, and then we'll see you tomorrow at noon for that also while you're there michael leibwood's latest article is out since your questions comments emails check out simplevisor.com which is our digital platform it's all there for you realinvestmentadvice.com have a great day see you back here tomorrow I would tell if I had a little money. It's a rich man's world. It's a rich man's world.